Hi guys, so we're going to um, run through today an approach to the injured patient, which is uh, going to be a, a very quick run through of essentially a traumatic ATE. Uh, and this is hopefully going to prepare you for uh, some of the simulation teaching that you're going to have on injured bleeding in pregnancy. <laughs> we talk about the injured patient I think we're often sort of often drawn to thoughts of like casualty and you know major trauma and, and all those sort of things and actually a lot of the the trauma you will experience as a junior doctor is actually relatively minor so a falls review is quite common somebody falls on the ward the nurses will bleed the doctor normally and, and get you to come and assess that patient but it's still important that we do that traumatic A to E approach as, as Joe was mentioning there and there are a few caveats so it's slightly different to the medical A to E and when we're teaching trauma we always teach that you start with actually a C so you do a C A B C D E and the C stands for catastrophic hemorrhage and hopefully that's not something you're going to experience on one of these uh, falls reviews that you do on a ward um, you probably won't experience it if you're part if you're in the emergency department as part of the major trauma team because that's normally something that's, that's managed pre-hospitally and by catastrophic hemorrhage, we mean something like a major arterial or venous hemorrhage from an amputated limb or a really significant vascular injury from a sort of a carotid or a femoral artery that's been that's been punctured, for example. And hopefully these aren't something that you'll come across on your trauma reviews. If you do, though, the key is to apply pressure. So direct and indirect pressure. We often use uh, tourniquets. You might see them in the military um, just to try and stop that bleeding and obviously call for help. Uh, and then after C, we obviously start with, with A. Airway always has to, in a traumatic situation, have a consideration of cervical spine injury. Uh, if the patient has come in and, and hasn't been immobilised, and if there is a concern about C-spine injury, and that's when we have to start thinking about whether we uh, perform some sort of immobilisation of the spine. Now, in a, in a um, primary survey situation, this might just be something as simple as delegating somebody to hold the patient, hold, hold the neck. But you really have to take this into consideration, particularly with combative patients, because actually pinning the patient down when they've got a, a neck fracture or potential cervical spine injury um, and they're sort of writhing against you will probably cause more injury than what it's worth. So it's really, it takes a little bit of clinical acumen to understand, but it's a consideration of whether it's actually feasible and reasonable to mobilise the um, cervical spine. Then when you look at um, look, look from the airway perspective, there can be any number of um, issues going on here. So there's specific sort of maxillofacial traumas that need to be considered um, and trauma in and around the face or neck, all of which can cause an airway obstruction, either from fractures, uh, so, so teeth, so sort of oral fractures, um, which can obstruct the airway, but also just from blood, vomitus and, and, and airway swelling. So all of these things we need to have a think about. And actually, we need to start considering whether we start performing suction and your standard manual airway manoeuvres and m escalating up that airway hierarchy from there to supercrotic airways and endotracheal tubes. And in a simulation perspective, that would include you escalating early to anaesthetics um, and or sort of ED reg um, and, and above level if you need airway support. Um, so that, that's pretty much it, I think, from, from from an airway perspective. And then we sort of move on to breathing, really. And then what do you kind of tend to look for then, Matt, in, in breathing? Obviously, you're going to check your respiratory rate and your sats and things. But I think the key for breathing, certainly when I'm doing a, a trauma call, is actually to kind of ignore the stethoscope. The stethoscope's in many ways the least important part of a, of a traumatic breathing assessment. And it's probably the opposite for a medical uh, breathing assessment but the, the the key is to have a look at the chest make sure you've got symmetrical movements you're looking for any evidence of bruising or any evidence of a flail chest so where part of the the chest or part of the ribs don't move in the same way as you'd expect uh, or doesn't move in the same way that the rest of the chest does and then you want to have a, a palpation of the chest so again you're assessing for for tenderness 
uh, particularly and making sure that there are any obvious rib fractures that you can feel. Um, percussion is very important to help detect sort of pneumothoraxes and, and hemothoraxes and things. And then, as I said, finally, you're, you're going to grab the stethoscope and have a quick listen. In that sort of initial A to E assessment, there, you're really trying to exclude four significant traumatic injuries. And that is, uh, number one, a tension pneumothorax. So you want to, do they have any distended neck veins? Is the trachea uh, deviated? Do they have no air entry on one side at all? A uh, massive hemothorax, again, would look pretty similar to, to a tension pneumothorax. Uh, possibly without the distended neck veins and the, and the movement of the trachea. Uh, a, a flail chest, which I've mentioned, so where part of the chest doesn't, is moving paradoxically to the rest of the chest. And an open pneumothorax, if you've got uh, normally penetrating trauma, but you can see it in blunt trauma, if you have a rib fracture that comes through uh, through the skin. If you've got an open pneumothorax there, you, you're going to want to seal that with a with a dressing. You tape up three aspects of the, of the square dressing and leave a little bit of it open. Um, and again, as Joe mentioned, oxygen uh, is, is quite important for your breathing assessment. Um, and then we move on to circulation, which is kind of the, the crux of trauma, really, isn't it, Joe? Yeah, no, absolutely. What's the heart rate doing? What, what, what's the blood pressure doing? Um, but also circulation in a traumatic um, position, in a traumatic patient, it should spark you to have a reassessment of whether there is not an exanguinating but a significant hemorrhage going on now quite frequently probably you know you, you experience this plenty in ED map but quite frequently from like pelvic fractures and things like this uh, might not be immediately catastrophic hemorrhage but it's certainly something in C that you need to pick up on isn't it mm. so, so looking at um, lo looking at uh, sort of all of those um, specific areas that a, a patient could bleed out into so their chest their abdomen their pelvis and, and their long bones and actually gaining a good history as to how much blood there was prior to coming into hospital. So quite often it might actually be quite easy to, to have a lack of oversight in the fact that this patient was picked up in a pool of their own blood um, on, on scene. And so they've lost a lot more, you know, it's just very, very simple uh, things like that. So we want to um, consider tenderness, swelling, uh, distension in these areas. We want to consider whether that relates to a, a tachycardia or a hypotension. Um, and then we want to uh, address that degree of shock. So, you know, even just looking at very simple things like increasing heart rate, reducing uh, blood pressure, looking for those signs as to whether actually we're going into shock. I know you love your your levels of shock, Matt, in terms of questions. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, something, it's, it's a useful visual reminder when you talk about your, we talk about tennis figures, so you're 0 to 15%, 15 to 30%, 30 to 40% and greater than 40% blood loss. Mm. And when you put that in sort of an, an average size adult, if you say somebody's lost, you know, 30% of a five litre circulating blood volume, that's one and a half litres of blood which they've lost, which just, which, uh, you know, sounds quite dramatic. And it just sort of impacts on how you resuscitate that patient. Mm. So one and a half litre blood loss means you kind of need to give them one and a half litre blood and blood products back, um, as opposed to giving them lots of saline or Cartman's or whatever crystalloid, which, well, essentially gives you just that, that dilutional effect mm. of the hemoglobin and, and dilutes your clotting factors as well. So I, I like the assessing the degree of shock from that perspective, because it just enables you to think a little bit more about how you're resuscitating that patient with your blood products. And then, and then sort of management of the, the circulation perspective, and, and me and Matt are always on the same page and from, from this avenue. And actually it's anti, if there's a major trauma, it's anti-crystalloids and pro-blood products. So you want to get blood products in early if um, this is necessary. Think about giving tranexamic acid to, to sort of reduce transfusional needs and, and replace like with like so you don't end up with that dilutional coagulopathy. Um, and, and again, arresting any trauma um, that that um, that is going to be causing that because essentially you're just going to be filling up the bath with the plug out otherwise. Absolutely. Um, so, so moving on from circulation, uh, begrudgingly, because it's probably one of the more interesting areas, you're going on to disability, which is everyone's least favourite, or maybe it's just me. Uh, <laughs> but but, but what, what, what do you look for in disability? Uh, I mean, so the key features are... Uh, any evidence of a head injury so, you know, in a trauma context and a, and a GCS. I mean, AFPU doesn't really float your boat, really. It doesn't really float my boat. It's got to be a proper GCS and, and evidence of a, of a subtle head injury as well. So obviously, when you're, you know, if you're in a, in a major trauma setting, you want to do a quick assessment. Is there an you know, obvious open or depressed skull fracture? Is there any uh, significant facial fractures? Any bleeding? What's the GCS, et cetera? What are the pupils doing? Um, but actually, when you've got a bit more time, you want to have a little look behind the ears, 
even yeah. in the ears for a hemotim you know, hemotympanum uh, battle sign um, bilateral um, the panda eyes as i call them um, you, what do you call them it's a periorbital lecomosis periorbital lecomosis yeah panda eyes uh, for us otherwise um, these are all signs of basic skull fracture so those are the things that you're looking for in, in particular you'll ask about vomiting as well at some stage not necessarily as part of the primary survey and obviously if, if they've got a reduced GCS you're going to be thinking about sort of getting them to off to off to CT mm. um, and the other aspect of, of disability once you move down from the head is is as you mentioned before is C-spine and, and just generally spinal injury mm. so can they move their legs their feet can they feel you touching both feet is it the same both sides same with the hands do they have any evidence of a spinal cord injury if they do immobilize them don't bother log rolling there's no point just get some imaging done mm, yeah. and a dm of course always forget, don't, don't ever forget the glucose uh, and you sort of already gone on to the, the the next bit in a way through through doing that so it sort of segues nicely in doesn't it and the, the next mm. part is looking at exposure and examination environment you know whatever ease you like to use so it's making sure the patient's warm temperature uh, you know um, hypothermic patients um, it doesn't help with their coagulability um, but you also then want to expose very briefly just to uh, do a quick run through secondary survey what is what sometimes we call it you might want to log roll to check um, for uh, certain specific things so uh, a good reason to log roll would be if there's suspected multiple stab wounds for example and you need to close that but the risk that you have here is that you you may disrupt um, clots and uh, worsen spinal injuries and they often say that the, the, the first clot is the best clot don't they so um, we don't want to be doing that um, to, and we don't want to be log rolling if at all possible so only if it's really really necessary um, and, and then really it's sort of out of my hands and goes into um, imaging and unfortunately we haven't made mobile CTs yet so this is much more <laughs> your, your realm Matt but yeah imaging is so important here isn't it absolutely and it, it's it's that so a lot of the trauma outcomes are related to time to CT and a lot of the, you know, obviously nice, the CT uh, head nice guidelines are very, are very time focused as well. So you've got to have scans done within one hour or within eight hours. So reducing that time to CT, getting your patient to CT is just in, associated with better outcomes. And it, the question really is, is what, what do you image? So do you go to CT head if they've only got a nice left head, head injury? Do you do a CT head and neck? If you're worried about a C-spine injury as well, or if they're a bit confused and you can't clear a C-spine, do you do a whole body CT, so a, a trauma CT, if it's a you know a major trauma setting with with multi-level injury, you, do you do nothing? So have you have you found no injury at all when they have an unexciting mechanism of injury, which is which does happen sometimes, or do you just do an isolated X-ray? So as you were mentioning on your exposure, have you, have you only found have you only found a, a humeral fracture or or an ankle injury or something that just needs needs an x-ray as opposed to anything sort of truncal. Yeah, it's generally not advocated to do a full body CT for a um, ankle inversion injury, mm -hmm. as I've been told multiple times. Um, so I, I just love, you know, love that ordering and getting the full imaging. So we really know what's going on with the patient. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with being thorough, but uh, you will annoy a lot of radiologists if you try and pan scan every ankle injury. <laughs> So that was a quick run through of how to do a traumatic A to E. I think key take home messages are don't forget to escalate, be systematic as ever with your A to E approach. Remember some of the trauma caveats that we just talked about. If the patient is shocked in the context of trauma, this is likely due to hemorrhage and replacing blood with blood. So giving them blood products as opposed to crystalloid is preferred. Involve your seniors in decision making around imaging and reducing time to definitive imaging is associated with better trauma outcomes. And hopefully it wasn't too traumatic listening to us. <laughs>